How many believe that? Say amen. 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 We serve a risen Savior. We're excited about today. We are glad you're here. So good to have guests with us today. And here's what we'd love for you to do. If you got a uh, brochure when you came in, a, uh, uh, we'd love for you to take that and open up. You'll find a guest card right there. And we'd love for you to take that sometime during the service and fill that out. You can drop that in the offering plate when it comes around. Or you can find a connection card right there in your seat. We're glad you're here. This is a special day. We're going to get a few things uh, uh, out of the way early on so we can just hear some beautiful music and you're you're going to be blessed today and a lot of time and prayer has gone into this and thank you so much for being here if you're a guest why don't you make yourself right at home right now let's take our song books and stand together and join the choir in that song hymn number 152 christ arose let's sing it like we believe it let's sing it like we're born again christians and let's raise the roof today god bless you amen low in the grave he lay but he didn't stay there he arose let's sing it on that first be able to stop and say we still have folks coming in they're looking for seats and so if you kind of help our ushers out right here and if you can move a little bit to the middle that would be great if you have some seats around you ushers if you watch this you have some seats around you would you lift your hand up so they can see where those seats are okay we have i know you don't want to do this but we have some down front and then in the balcony there and folks as y'all see folks come in between now really and 11 o'clock if you will just kind of motion them and help the ushers that would be great and this is a good problem to have let's sing together that song sing it loud here we go death cannot keep his prey death Number 147, Christ the Lord is risen today. Every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection, but today is the very special day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's risen today. Sing it on that first. Christ the Lord. Folks are coming in. Let's put a big smile on and extend a warm Tennessee handshake. Let's greet our guests today and move around to a little fellowship. And thank you for coming to church. Find someone you don't know and greet them today.
and is shaking hands. Let's sing that second verse as the last lives again. Lives again. Hymn number 149, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. You know our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, not so He could just say that He rose from the dead, but so that we have a Savior who lives, and He can make an impact in our lives, can change our lives so that we can live for Him. Let's sing it on that first verse. God sent His Son. singing this morning. Our ushers are coming for the offering today, and uh, just uh, we'll make just a few prayer requests, and so you have some idea of how the morning will progress in just a while. Our choir uh, will make the presentation. It is finished, and there'll be some film with that. In fact, a premiere film with that, and uh, then at the conclusion of that, I'll preach a gospel message from the book of John, and then the conclusion of the service will have most of our announcements. And uh, we are so thankful that you're here. And this is the time, if you have a ch had a chance to fill out that guest card to drop it in the offering plate. And if not, you can fill it out. What we'd love for you to do is bring that out to the main desk out in the lobby here, the main lobby there. My wife and I are there. We have a special gift we'd like to give you there uh, at uh, the, uh, the uh, information desk. And uh, in fact, we're going to place uh, a free gift in there of the premiere video that you'll see portions of today. And we'd love for you to uh, get that, and we'd love to meet you today. So if you're a guest, uh, we'd love for you to bring that guest card out to the information desk. If you're going out another uh, exit, we understand that, but we sure would like for you to have that today. So we'll dispense with most of the announcements. Let me just mention these for prayer as we uh, get ready to pray for the offering. Why don't you pray for Mrs. Mildred Tetley, and she has a very, very important medical test tomorrow morning, and she has asked her church family to pray, and I want you to do that. And then also Mrs. Terry Kiefer had some surgery uh, yesterday and had to stay just a little longer. Uh, she is recovering at home. We're praying for her. Brother James Scott is home now, and then also praying for Nancy Dreyer. She recovers from the installation of her pacemaker, 
and, uh, and then also praying for Mrs. Linda Palmer. She recovers from her back surgery. And then uh, Brother Bob Moore and Rex Gurley were praying for these that are uh, uh, finishing up their cancer treatments. Brother Bob finishes on Thursday and uh, has some tests now in about two weeks. I want you to pray for him. And also for Cassandra Kirster as she battles lymphoma. And the brother uh, Dave Porter, Don Porter's son and Sharon Stanzak's brother, uh, is taking a good turn right now, and we're thankful for that. We're going to pray and ask God to bless this offering and then bless the service to follow. And uh, I really want you to uh, take some time as you hear the beautiful music, and we are reminded of the gruesome scene there on Calvary, what it was all about. It was all about our salvation. And the fact that we have heaven as our home and eternal life because of what Jesus did there. And then also the beautiful resurrection. And that's what we celebrate today. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today asking you please to bless this offering. You know what the needs are. And I pray you'll bless each need and meet those. Help us to be uh, right with you as we give. And then also we pray for these we mentioned by name. So many on our list, Lord. We pray especially for Mrs. Tetley as she goes through this very important test tomorrow. And bless her and her dear husband. And then also Brother Terry, or Miss Terry Kiefer and her husband, we're praying for them. And then so many else uh, here on our list for Mrs. Palmer and others. We pray that you'll bless and encourage these and uh, heal them up, Miss Nancy Dreyer and others. Heal them up. And then, Father, as we spend just some time remembering the cross and those terrible hours there and what they mean to us, Lord, as far as our life and eternal life. And the fact that we can have all of our sins forgiven and washed away. And then the beautiful garden tomb that was empty when the ladies got there. Oh, Lord, what a wonderful day this is. And help us to remember that, meditate on that, and be thankful and grateful for that. We pray that you'll bless our time together. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Sometimes I miss spending my days fishing. The smell the salty air, the seaside breeze, the taste of fresh fish from that day's catch. Would you ever go back to that life again, Peter? Never. As the master says, we serve a greater purpose now, fishers of men. Besides, the fishing industry has too many scoundrels and thieves. Andrew could tell you what we do with thieves. Just toss them overboard. Should we not practice what the master taught us about mercy and forgiveness? This ruffian had stolen from us on no less than seven different occasions. On this day, I found him trying to pickpocket this very knife. We threw him over less than 50 cubits from shore. He swam back safely. Besides, after seven times, I think I'd forgiven him enough. In fact, I think Jesus would agree. Lord! You wicked woman! You come here to enter a married man's home to yet again practice your adulterous ways, no doubt! It's time you finally pay the price you deserve for your sin! Come with me! What is truth? Sir, a message from your wife. This is madness. She's out of line. She's very troubled, sir. She insists that I delivered it right away. You tell my wife to stop concerning herself with the fate of this man. Good day. I find in him no fault. Should I release unto you the king of the Jews? We have no king but Caesar! Give us Barabbas! Crucify him! I wash my hands of this man. should someone sin against me and I forgive them till seven times father forgive them for they know not what they do of blood that stained its frame were shed to wash away our shame from the scars pure love released salvation by the mercy tree
In the sky between two thieves Hung the blameless Prince of Peace Bruised and battered, scarred and scored Sacred head pierced by our thorns It is finished was his cry The perfect lamb was crucified His sacrifice, our victory Our Savior chose the mercy tree Hope went dark that violent day the whole earth quaked at love's display. Three days silent in the ground, this body born for heaven's crown. But on that bright and glorious day, when heaven One of the greatest things that we saw on the cross of Calvary was the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even leading up to that time, of course, when that woman was caught in adultery and Jesus wrote in the sand, what amazing grace that he showed her at that time. Would you stand with me? And let's sing that old song that everyone knows, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. But think about what Christ did for you in showing that amazing grace. Sing it together. Amen.
verse together. Twas I hear about him, they're wonderful. This is the man that threatened to destroy the temple, which is nothing short of recklessness and blasphemy. Well, he should get a fair trial nonetheless. He will. The high priest and the council are determining his fate, even now. A trial this late at night? That's certainly unusual. What do you think? You're a disciple of Jesus. I am not. You must be mistaken. Hmm. You definitely look familiar. Why would you ignore my message and not honor my wishes? Because you have no business interfering with my judgment. You do not determine who lives and who dies. I do. I cannot sleep without seeing this man in my dreams. As he suffers for crimes he did not do. And you let that happen. You deny justice to an innocent man. Were you not there in the garden when this Jesus was arrested? If I remember correctly, you were the one who attacked my friend and cut off his ear. I don't know what you speak of. I do not know him. I declared him innocent. His own people condemned him to death. I was just following their custom. They chose to release Barabbas over Jesus. And since when do we practice the tradition and religion of the Jews? We are Roman! You have a duty to the people of this region and this entire empire to carry out justice, to ensure punishment for the guilty and freedom for the innocent. What was I supposed to do? If I had let him live, who knows how much violence the angry mob would have unleashed on our city. The death of this one man saves many. Once again, the people condemned him to death, not me. They do not determine who lives and who dies. You do. You can keep telling yourself the lie that you are not responsible, but you have forsaken a man during the most desperate moment of his life. That is the truth. What is truth? Why do you deny the truth? You are a disciple of Jesus. This man saw you. Curse you, woman, for the final time. I don't know this Jesus, nor have I ever met him. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me?
cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. You can remain seated, but we're going to dismiss our children back to their enjoyable times. But I want you to think as you sing about the cross and about what Jesus had to go through before he ever got to raise from the, rise from the grave. And there's so much that he went through for our sins. Let's reflect on that. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Alas, and did my Savior
woman of your reputation does not deserve to see Jesus. Go away. What are you doing? You cannot go in there. Do you know who I am? With all due respect, sir, no man can enter into the Holy of Holies. But God himself dwells within. Then how do I get to God? You cannot pass. Forbidden area. The high priest can enter once a year to make atonement for our sins and to speak to God on our behalf. We can access God only through the high priest. Whether you are a peasant or a man of prestige, you cannot go before God. I see. I came here to find answers, to find God, to find the truth. I suppose I'll have to find them somewhere else. Soldier, we've been reassigned.
to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth.
Let's bow for a word of prayer. We've just had a chance to see and hear the gospel message, but also the end of the gospel message is a risen Savior. In just a moment, we're going to read from Scripture and just share some thoughts, but let's just pray just a moment and be thankful. Father, we want to take just a moment to say that we're sorry for the way that men treated you on Calvary when you walked on earth. You did all of that for us, for every person inside this building today, and for every person that's ever been born. And Lord, I'm sorry for the way that mankind treats you today, right now. Father, forgive us as Christians for not doing more to glorify you and your name. And we ask you, Lord, today to help people repent and confess their sin and come to you. Convict us today, Lord, for those that are not sure that heaven is their home. And may they settle that before they leave this place today. And Father, convict us as born-again Christians to do more than ever before to spread the good news of the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You have your Bibles. I want you to turn to John chapter 19. And I'm going to actually finish the story scripturally. I'm grateful for what we were able to view and hear, and in just a moment you have a chance to thank the choir for all of that. John chapter 19, we'll not read the whole section of Scripture, then also we read a little bit about the resurrection there in Matthew 28. But let me just say that there is so much to be said about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand that I don't want anything that I say or anything that happens here to take place of the simple gospel, and that is this. Uh, Jesus Christ died, he was buried for three days, and he rose again. And the Bible says if we'll believe that, we can be born again Christians. Capsulized in that great verse, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many believe that? Say amen. John chapter 19, I want to take just a little capsule portion of this scripture, and I'm going to have you stand and read together with me just a few verses. If you'll stand with me, please, I'll respect the Word of God, and then we'll read just a few verses in Matthew 28 about the resurrection uh, you've been sitting for a while, and so I want you to follow along as I read, and I'll take a text verse here in John chapter 19, pick up reading in verse number 26, in John chapter 19, verse 26. Jesus is hanging on the cross here, and we pick up the context in verse 26. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple, that is John, of course, the disciple standing by him, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. Would you read with me our text, verse verse 30? Let's read that in unison and get together out loud. Verse 30, ready? When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. If you turn back just a few pages to Matthew chapter number 28. In Matthew chapter number 28, we'll pick up reading in verse number 1. As we read the resurrection, John details it, but all of the gospel writers confirm the empty tomb. And in Matthew chapter 28, this is the day we celebrate today. In the end of the Sabbath, verse 1, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, how may I thank God that before the sun came up this morning, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was out of that grave. I was, my wife and I got up early this morning to see the sunrise and and it was kind of cloudy out. We wondered, we really get to see it. And I know that some people have sunrise services, and I think that's a wonderful thing. 
Somebody said one time, if you really biblically did a sunrise service, then all the women would get up early and go and come back and tell the men. <laughs> but as I was coming down those stairs this morning, it was still very, very dark. And I got to thinking about those ladies as they hustled toward that tomb. Though they'd been told over and over and over again that Jesus would rise when they found that empty tomb and came back and told the apostles and that Peter and John took off on a dead run. One of them was so excited he outrun the other one. I think that's great they put that in Scripture. That's where we're at right here in verse 1. Began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel. The Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Would you say that with me together? Ready? He is not here, for he is risen. That's what the Bible says. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. The Bible says that over 500 people had a chance to see the risen Savior. I think about those two men that walked on the road to Emmaus. And he slipped in and joined them, and they had no clue who he was until he started teaching them the Scriptures. It was so deep and so profound. God took away the veil of their eyes, and he was, they were able to see that they walked and talked with Jesus. And how they compelled him to walk just a little further and to sit down to supper with him. And then as quickly as he joined them, he was gone. And over and over, the Scripture details the risen Savior. How anyone can deny that, I don't understand. Verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher, with fear and great joy and did run and bring his disciples word and father today we feel just that today a certain amount of fear but great joy teach us from thy word we pray in jesus name amen thank you may be seated as he suffered for our sins on the cross in that place of the skull, Golgotha, Jesus uttered seven statements from the cross. And here we find three in John chapter 19. You may want to make quick note of these. There are seven, but three are very important. First of all, the care of his mother. The secondly, the cry of thirst. And thirdly, the completion of redemption. I'll speak the most on that last cry. But as we look at the tender care of our Lord, the care of His mother as He was breathing some of His last breaths, He said, Behold, thy mother, He said to John. My wife and I were talking this morning how He'd walked and talked with those disciples for three and a half years when it came to the most important time of His life. They all left except for the ladies and John. John stayed close enough that he was able to look down from the cross and in so many words was saying, I need you to take care of my mother. He calls her woman here because I believe here the Son of God is breaking his earthly ties as he heads back to his throne on high to be seated next to the Father. Remember, Joseph was not his father. God the Father was his father. It is a reminder of how much Jesus cares for all of us while we continue our journey here. And I want you to understand that as you came into this service today, we all carried a heavy load in here. But I want you to know that your biggest load is not your financial burdens. Your biggest load is not maybe some relationship burden. Your biggest burden is not your health or ill health. Your biggest burden is your sin burden. And he wants to help you with that today. 
the care of his mother over the second thing down the cry of thirst and it's notable here in verse 28 and 29 it says after this jesus knowing all things were accomplished uh, that the scriptures might be fulfilled he said this he said i thirst now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled the spo a sponge with vinegar and put it upon the hyssop and he put it to his mouth in one place it said he didn't drink and here it indicates that it did touch his lips you can make of this whatever you want to make of it, but it is amazing to me, first of all, that the Son of God, who was the very God, got in a place like this that He was thirsty. The one who created the entire sea and all the oceans and every river. The one who created the water table beneath our feet. The one who allowed it to rain hangs there on the cross and says, I thirst. Of course, it was prophesied and the Old Testament in Psalm 69, 21, the Bible says, And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Psalm twenty two fifteen says, My tongue cleaves to my jaw. I don't know what you think, but I think at this point he is about to uh, give up the ghost, the Bible says. And between the loss of blood and the dehydration in his body, I'm sure that that, that moisture that was added to his parched lips and his tongue loosened them just enough to make the next statement which would change the entire world world he said i thirst and then he made the statement which was the completion of our redemption he said it is finished he didn't say he was finished some probably thought boy he's a goner we got him right where we want him and i'm sure satan and all these demons were holding him to the ropes they said we got him right where we want him but remember in genesis they would only bruise the heel of jesus but here on Calvary, it'd be a mortal wound to Satan would bruise his head. They thought he was a goner. They thought this was an end. They thought that all of our troubles would be washed away. And Caiaphas, the high priest, was the ringleader of all of it. We've got to get rid of this guy. He didn't say he was finished. He said, it is finished. Three times scripture in scripture, God said that there was something very important that was finished. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 uh, he says this thus the heavens and earth were finished and all the host of them creation was perfectly complete and understand this on that day before he rested we understand that what he said about creation was it was very good in fact it was perfect it's sin that destroyed the perfect creation the second time we find the word, the idea that something was finished by God is in Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. The Bible says this, And the seventh angel poured out his vow into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. After seven seals were opened, and then seven trumpets after the seventh seal, and then there are seven vows or bowls of God's wrath poured out on the earth. At the end of that seven vow, that seven bowl, he said, it's done. The judgment of God on the earth is complete. And I want you to understand, though, I'm not preaching this today. There is coming a day after the rapture of the church that seven years of tribulation will be poured out on this thing. And if you're not paying attention to the news right now, you better pay attention. Jesus Christ is coming again. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Now, here as he breathes his last breath on earth, our Lord and Savior completes one more thing, and probably the most important thing, and that is our redemption our justification our salvation was bought and paid for by his precious blood in his commentary Bible scholar and preacher Warren Wearsby said this and I quote it is finished the phrase is only one word in the Greek text teltelesti is the word and the word was common among merchants and it meant to a merchant it is the price the price is paid in full. Shepherds and priests used it when they found the perfect lamb ready for sacrifice in the Old Testament. And Christ died as that perfect lamb of God. Servants would use it when their work was completed and would use this word when they reported back to their masters, tetelestai, meaning the job is finished. Here Christ, the obedient servant, had finished the work the Father gave him to do. Christ willingly and deliberately gave up his life, laid it down for his friends. So when Jesus makes this statement in verse number 30, he is declaring that his portion of work 
on this earth was perfectly complete. But he was just getting started with his new work as our Lord. So I want to just leave with a couple thoughts here. What was finished? We sang about it. We saw film footage about it. Just exactly what was finished. And why is this so important? And why does it matter to you and I today? When Jesus said it is finished, his last words, the Bible says, then he commended his spirit to the Lord. What is so important about that? May I suggest, first of all, that scripturally, number one, the Old Testament law was fulfilled. I want you to think about that. All those books in the Bible you're trying to figure out uh, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets and the patriarchs and the people, they spent their years slaying animals on an altar to atone for their sins. And God uh, commanded that that be done. And then John the Baptist comes in the Gospels and he preaches this about Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. One day there would be a lamb that would come that would take place of all of those perfect sacrificial lambs. And that lamb would be Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist prophesies of that. On this day when Jesus died, as you saw depicted, the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom as God was declaring to the whole world, the law has been fulfilled. Nobody could go behind that veil except the high priest once a year. And that was on the Day of Atonement, which, my friend, that is the exact day that Jesus Christ died for us. No more slaying of animals. Secondly, I suggest to you that also the Scripture teaches when He said it is finished that Messianic prophecy is fulfilled. Messiah has come. There are two types of Messianic prophecies in the Bible. One type points to Christ's first coming, and the second type points to His second coming. The first coming of Jesus Christ, of course, is virgin birth and Bethlehem and all that. And we just came through Christmas a few months ago and just how precise those prophets were as they gave us information about where Jesus would be born and how it all come to pass. It was amazing and all of it is precise. Prophecies of his first coming, about his sinless life, about his death. Isaiah 53 and many other Messiah, uh, Messianic Psalms predicted all this. And some of these are even in our text this morning. If you look at your Bible, we'll find some of these uh, pre uh, 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 Christ's first coming. Look, look at verse 20. Why did he say this in verse 28? It says, In this Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished. Now remember, that was the Son of God dying there. He was 100% God and 100% man. But he knew what was going on. And he understood that he was coming down to his last moments. And this was prophesied. It says in verse 28, <coughs> That the Scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. You say, why did he do that? Because it was prophesied he would do that. He would say that. Look over at verse number uh, 36 in the same chapter 19. These things, when it came around to break the legs of the criminals, Jesus was already dead. And they, remember, the, so the soldier had, had pierced his side. And the Bible says, you say, why did all that happen? Well, it says in verse 36, For these things were done, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another Scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. That's taken right out of Psalm 34 and Zechariah chapter 12. Ladies and gentlemen, what God was telling us on that day. He wanted you to understand that this was the Lamb of God which taken away the sin of the world that was prophesied in all those books of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is Messiah. Jesus Christ is God. He's not some hippie depicted on some silly theater performance coming out of Hollywood. Jesus Christ was a sinless, spotless Son of God. Amen. Messianic prophecy was fulfilled. The second type a prophecy points to his second coming, Zechariah and Ezekiel. And Daniel and other Old Testament prophets spoke in detail about, about Christ's second coming. And even Christ himself prophesied of his return to earth as he is getting ready to go away. He's trying to explain to his disciples in John chapter 14, and he says this to them, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Messianic prophecy was fulfilled on Calvary. And then my last thought, may I suggest to you that our redemption was complete. 
when Jesus said it is finished. Several things here I want you to think about, take note of. When Jesus said it was finished, he immediately tasted death for every man. Right there that moment, he immediately tasted death for every man. The Bible says that Jesus Christ would do that, that he would taste death. He would take away that sting of death. Oh, death, where is that sting? Oh, grave, where is that victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be unto God, to Jesus Christ, who giveth us the victory. Teleestai, teleestai was a victor, victorious cry, a cry of triumph. And your sting of death is taken away. You say, how do you know that? I won't know till I die, and you won't either. But I know one thing. The Bible teaches absent from the body present with the Lord. You'll never smell the sulfur of hell. You'll never feel the heat of the flames. The sting of death is gone. That moment, he said it is finished. Secondly, he immediately paid off your sin debt with his precious blood. He dealt a death blow to the head of Satan. A long few that started back in the Garden of Eden was settled on this day. And you and I that believe are the recipients of the atoning power of his precious blood. I want you to think about that. That if you'll believe in the finished work of Calvary, you can be born again. I wrote this third thing down. There at that moment when he said it is finished, he suffered hell for you and was victorious in that. And I don't mean to drag you down in a bunch of theology, but I was just reading the other day in, about this very subject. And I checked, by the way, somebody's going to suffer your hell. And it may, may as well be Jesus Christ who was your substitute because he's the only one that could do it and triumph over it. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 27, the apostle Peter was preaching at Pentecost and he references a statement that King David made in one of the Messianic Psalms about Jesus in Psalm 16, 10. And he says this in Acts 2, 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And I don't want you to think that Jesus uh, felt one bit of heat from those flames. I do want you to understand that he suffered your hell. Paul spoke of this event in Ephesians 4, 8, when he says this, when he ascended up on high, speaking of Jesus, he led to captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended, uh, the same also is ascended far above the heavens, that he might fulfill all things. Again, Paul talks about this victorious uh, matter with Jesus in Colossians 2.15. The Bible says, And having spoiled principalities and powers that speak of the devil in his underworld, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them all. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to have to suffer hell because Jesus Christ died on the cross for that. I read this fourth thing down. He made a way for us to get out of the grave. I like that one right there. John... Chapter 20, let's pick up some reading right here. If you have your Bible still open, they buried him in a place close by. It was a garden. I had a friend just got back from Israel, and he sent me video footage. I said, how big is it in there? He said, well, I went in there and took a bunch of pictures and sent me the video. He said, the main thing I want you to know, he wasn't there. It was empty. Tomb was empty. Verse 1, chapter 20, again, the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. And the sepulchre seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre, and she, then she runneth and comes to Simon Peter and other disciples. And by the way, there's a lot of commentary in all this. If you read all the Gospels, whom Jesus loves, saith unto him, They have taken away the Lord from the sepulchre, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the, and the other disciple outrun Peter came first to the sepulcher, and he stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then come a Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And by the way, notice the detail that they're given about this tomb. There was someone in there, and they're not in there now. They knew they put him in there. They knew how he was dressed. They knew how they had taken care of things. And he wasn't in there. The clothes were left behind. So much I could say. Verse 8, Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that, it must rise, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again under their home. Now watch this. But Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down. 
I looked into the sepulcher and see two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. When she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed him to be a garden, saith unto, gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have, have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. I like this next verse. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, my sheep hear my voice, and they knoweth me. Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Robon, I, which is saying, Master, I thought about here's Jesus now out of the grave and he says this to Mary and by the way this is Mary Magdalene one of the Marys that he cast out seven demons he said to Lazarus who had been dead three days Lazarus come forth one of these days I don't know when I hope it's not soon but one of these days he's going to say Mike Mike, my dead, lifeless body's going to drop to the ground, but I'm going to be out of here. They'll embalm me and they'll take me over here to one of the funeral homes from 4 to 8 visitation. And I have ordered my family to make sure that I have a smile on my face. But you remember, I'll never be more alive. Jesus told Mary and Martha when he went to raise Lazarus, said, he said, he that believeth in me shall never die. You understand that death for a Christian is a passing. Death for an unsaved person is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And he made a way for us to get out of the grave. Some of you are sitting here right now. And you buried loved ones recently. I think of the dear police officer that lost his life in Hopkinsville. And how they mourn for him. But he is born again. He's not there. I wrote this fifth thing down. He's finished heaven for us. I got to hurry. He finished heaven. There's so much when he said it is finished. I know that there are theologians that just like to kind of pin things down. But I think mainly he's talking about our redemption. And so much is included in that redemption. And understand that, that he has finished heaven for us. And he said in John 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, he's, he's not working on it. Some people think, well, he's been working on it for 2,000 years. Must be really, really nice. No, it's done. Paul got a glimpse of it when he was caught up in the third heaven. He saw things that he was not able to come back and humanly put in words. And he just said this. He said, look, he said, I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. You think of the most beautiful place in all the world. And I've seen some pretty places. You don't hold a candle to what heaven's going to be like. John describes it in Revelation chapter 21. Someday you might want to read about it. I, can't, I cannot believe that I'd ever walk on streets of gold. And then lastly, he made a way from earth to heaven. And he did so without dying. He made a way from earth to heaven without dying. I want you to take your Bibles and turn one more place, and I'm finished. If you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. At the conclusion of that video, I, I know that you noticed that Jesus appeared to be going up in the sky, and that was portrayed as best that a movie camera can picture it. And I know that some of you kind of stuck in the Star Wars and uh, outer space thing and beam me up, Scotty, and all that. I understand that. But if we just kind of come back to reality for just a while, they didn't pull ideas like that out of the sky. The idea is given right here in Scripture. After Jesus had rose from the grave and had revealed himself to over 500 people, Paul said, he ascended back to heaven. 
We'll pick up reading in verse number 9, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Understand this today. He is showing you and I in the ascension how he's going to come back and how we're going to go up. The Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one of these words. The word, the phrase caught up comes from a Latin word, rapturo, rapture. That's where you get the word. And that's where you and I are right now. Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins. He was buried for three days. He rose again on the third. How many believe he's alive right now? Say amen. And you and I are living in this age of grace waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. Now, friend, I want to challenge you. That can happen at any moment. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it happened today? Now, let me ask you a question. Jesus said this. He said, for him and for his work, the will of the Father, he said this, it is finished. One of these days, your life will be completed. How will you finish? Someday you'll breathe your last breath or the Lord Jesus Christ will come back. But one way or the other, your life here on earth will be complete. You may not get a chance to say your goodbyes. You might. You may not get a chance to say anything. But how will you finish? How are you going to finish? Let me, let me just be a little more blunt. How have you planned to get out of the grave? How have you planned to escape hell? Now, I know there's all kind of thought out there, and the spirit of Antichrist is in our world, and he's trying to dissolve any thought of the gospel and of Jesus. We live in a very, very anti-God world, and this is a real thing, and people are turning away from the church left and right, and you know they are. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How have you get caught up in that? Let me ask you, okay, how are you going to get out of the grave? And how are you going to escape hell? Because it doesn't matter what is prevalent in our society and what the thinking is right now, what the trends are. Trends mean nothing when the trump of God sounds. And trends mean nothing when that little, little beeping noise stops on your monitors beside your bed. It's beep, 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 beep. That means nothing then. So have you made your decision? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In just a moment, the choir is going to sing. But right now, I want to ask you something very, very important. If you will believe in the finished work of salvation that Jesus accomplished on the cross, you can be saved and have eternal life. If you will believe that you're a sinner right now and you need to be saved, if you'll trust Christ's death, His burial, His resurrection, you can have all your sins forgiven and go to heaven. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now that is a promise. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It is finished. It's the gift of God, all in a package, ready for you to receive it. You say, preacher, if you only knew what kind of sinner I was, it doesn't matter. I don't need to know that. Jesus knows all of that. And some pretty wicked people came to Christ. In fact, the first person that had a chance to lay eyes on him was a 
born again lady named Mary Magdalene who had lived an awful life. This is the promise of God. He that believes on the Son hath everlasting life. Let me ask you, will you trust Him today? I'm asking you to depend on Christ to get you to heaven. Will you do that right now with our heads bowed, our eyes closed? Here's what I'd like for you to do. I believe that salvation is a simple thing. I think it's taught throughout scriptures. And I don't think you have to work for your salvation. If we got to heaven on our good works, then we wouldn't need Jesus. Salvation is by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul taught us in Ephesians. With their heads bowed, our eyes closed, and no one looking around, I want to ask you right now, if you would take Jesus Christ as your Savior, just as you are right now, we're going to sing that song, Just As I Am. Would you take Him as your Savior? I want to pray the sinner's prayer right now, and I pray this with hundreds of people, but I want to pray it right now for you. And I'd love for you to join me in this prayer, and I'd love for you to sincerely and genuinely mean what you're praying. If you would take Christ right now, just like you are, I'm going to help you receive it. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God that raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. A strong word. Don't have to be maybe or guess at it. Thou shalt be saved. Three verses down it says this. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, again, shall be saved. I want you to be saved. I want you to have all your sins washed away. I can't do that, but Jesus can do that right now. Or the heads bowed, or eyes closed. Would you let me help you call on his name right now? Here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. And I believe that you died for me on the cross. And I believe that you were buried for three days. And I believe that you rose from the grave on the third day. And that you're alive right now. Lord, I ask you to forgive me my sins. And save me. I confess you today. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. See, preacher, I prayed that. I meant that. I wanted to be born again. By the way, I'm the only one looking right now. I would not come to you, wouldn't call your name out. I would not embarrass you. I promise you that. But if you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer right now, you want to be born again, you receive Christ right now, would you lift your hand? Just put it up real high. I prayed that. I meant that. I want to be born again. Just put your hand right up, right back down. I prayed that. I meant that. I want to be born again. God bless you. Thank you. Arthur. Just put your hand right up, right back down. I prayed that. I meant that. I want to be born again. Just right up, right back down. God bless you. Anyone else? Let's stand together, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We'll sing the old song, Just As I Am. You all know this. That's how the Lord wants you to come, just as you are. As we're closing out this service in here today, I want you to be praying. Christians, you be praying. We're closing out several services here in this building and other buildings on the property. We want God to have His way. Today, if you confess Christ as your Savior, why don't you come and tell one of these workers down front? We'd love to have you do that. You don't have to do that. We'd love to have you do that. Maybe I didn't see your hand. I just saw some. Maybe you just want to come at an old-fashioned altar. There'll be somebody here to pray with you. We're going to have a man standing on the end of each aisle. As we give our invitation today, church has been doing this for, for hundreds of years. If you're a man, a man will talk with you about the Lord. If you're a lady, a lady will talk with you about the Lord. They'll hand you off to a lady. We want to help you today. Maybe there's something you want to pray about on this Easter Sunday. We want to help you today. And maybe this morning, if you've been saved, not been baptized, we work you through all of that. Father, bless this invitation as we sing today. May we come just as we are. In Jesus' name, amen. We're singing right now. You come, would you? Just as I am.
there's another need in your life, we want you to feel free to come. We'll sing that verse together. And I'm having this kind of start this course. I've been hearing this song ever since I was a little boy. I remember going to the altar call, mom and dad, and revival meetings, and tent meetings, and pray and ask God to help me be a good Christian, help me live for Him. I remember the day on May 30th, 1965, and I prayed as a little boy to receive Christ as Savior. I've never been the same. I'm going to ask you to kind of get this started. We'll sing the first verse, and I want you to sing it. Let's be thankful that we came to Jesus just as we are, and He saved us. Let's sing with you. Just as I